Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Keep It Simple, Three Ways to Get More from Your Capture Solution. I'm Teresa Resick, Director of Webinars here at AIM, and AIM is your host and producer of today's event. And with me today from AIM is Peggy Winton, and then we also have Justin Betancourt from Dell EMC. Dell EMC is the underwriter of today's webinar, and we thank them for their support. And thank you for taking the time to join us today. And as we get started, just want to offer a few pointers for viewing today's webinar. By joining our webinars live, you can customize your own viewing experience. Feel free to open, close, or resize the different windows. And across the bottom of your screen is a list of all of the widgets available to you. You can download a PDF of the presentation at any time. Just look to the resources list that's to the right side of the slide area. And there are also a few other documents and links in there to help you learn more about today's topic. Feel free to ask questions throughout the hour using the Q&A feature. We will hold these until the end where we should have about five or ten minutes to answer them. And at the end of this webinar, a brief survey will open in your browser and would appreciate it if you would take a few moments to offer your feedback and to suggest other topics for us to cover. You can also access the survey in the list of widgets across the bottom of your screen at any time. This webinar is being recorded, and it will be posted to AIM.org's Resources Webinars page in just a few days. I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce our speakers today. Uh, very pleased to have both these people with us. And uh, first, let me tell you a little bit about Peggy Winton. As Interim President, Peggy is responsible for the Strategic and Operational Direction of AIM. She joined the association in 2002 and has served as Vice President, Sales and Marketing as Chief Marketing Officer and also Chief Operating Officer. Prior to AIM, Peggy was a Principal Consultant for Computer Sciences, one of the largest systems integrators and professional services firms in the world. And we also have with us today Justin Betancourt, and Justin is a Senior Manager for Product Management for Dell EMC's Enterprise Content Division. Justin has over 15 years of capture experience and is currently leading product management responsibilities for Dell EMC's LeapSnap Cloud Capture application. So right now, I am going to turn things over to Peggy Winton to begin her talk today. Peggy? Hi, Teresa, and hi to everyone out here. Here's what we thought we would share with you today. If you aren't already experiencing dynamic capture, we want to help you make the business case. Maybe you've heard about some of the benefits that can be gained and you just need some help to drive those points home with your colleagues or uh, the executives in your organizations. What are the things that you can accomplish and what are some of the uh, improved processes that you can drive using dynamic capture? We'd like to suggest that you think about capture at the leading edge of a process. What does that mean? Well, for years we've talked about the movement from scan to archive to scan to process. And this is taking that one step further and saying, what are those initial touch points of any type of your content? the leading edge of starting or invoking a process. How do you do that? We're also going to talk about the various forms that capture takes. What are the various inbound ramps or inputs? And we know all of our content is getting more uh, varied. Uh, it's in lots of different forms, and it's coming at us faster and faster. Let's look at those different ways. We also want to talk about what is driving this movement towards dynamic capture and demands for a mobile and disparate workforce, and also uh, with regard to access and, and hosting in the cloud. We'll share some results of that. And like anything, it's not easy. You can't snap your fingers and just say uh, it'll happen tomorrow. But there are uh, some options for organizations of almost any size. We want to talk about what some of those challenges are and ways that you can overcome those challenges. And finally, uh, we'll um, 
give me some conclusions and make some recommendations. And in all of this, we want to make sure that we bring it home, give you some specific examples of these concepts. And that's where I'm going to ask my esteemed colleague, Justin, to uh, provide some real cases, some, some real world examples from uh, the diverse customer base that Dell EMC enjoys. Does that sound OK? If so, uh, let's get going here. Ideally, dynamic capture brings the information into your information environment, your ecosystem. It applies some immediate controls or rules, and it makes it accessible for action to drive the processes and activities that your organization desires. That's what makes it one of the most important important elements in an organization. Put another way, we're going to be looking at sort of three pieces or three main elements of dynamic capture. Um, the source, the inputs, uh, the activities that it's driving, and the outputs. What's the intelligence that it can glean? Who's getting access to that? So we want to make sure that we view this in the filter of these three elements. According to AIM research, 32% of you said that you're trying to understand or you're actively defining your strategy for a cloud deployment of capture, and yet you're struggling to fully realize the potential of your current systems. Or you may think, gosh, I, this could just be a short-term project or it might be a test, and you believe that making a big investment is just not going to deliver that ROI. We hope that you'll see by the end of our discussion today that capture solutions don't have to be so cumbersome, especially when modern offerings can be engineered in the cloud. They can offer you a lot of flexibility. So we're going to create a foundation for you um, with uh, some good research. And I hope you all avail yourselves of uh, research that AIM does on a regular basis. We go out to uh, hundreds and hundreds of, uh, of our community members, and we ask them all about uh, the things that are pushing their business to uh, use these technologies and these tools. So we're going to create a little baseline for that. We also uh, want to start by saying, um, here's some things to keep in mind to make the most of your capture solutions. Um, there are new lightweight purpose-built applications that are intuitive, they're accessible from anywhere, and they can integrate with your existing systems to make this a more holistic approach and make it a lot easier to accomplish. And there are ways to integrate those new ideas and practices into your or operations so people don't just accept them, but they want to use them. That's a real switch, and I know that Justin's going to be able to share that uh, information and some tips there for us. And we want to make sure that uh, you do learn about those options, those enterprise-ready capture-as-a-service options that um, can get you started uh, without a huge investment. And maybe that's the best way to start out. Uh, you're just simply unable to make that big commitment. Well, you don't have to. Uh, you can be ready uh, in a few weeks, and you can begin immediately to realize some ROI. Okay. So let's share uh, the first uh, bit of research that we have. Um, you know that, uh, gosh, uh, it wasn't that long ago where paper made up about 90% of all of our business information and what we were touching uh, every day. And that's the reason why Capture conjures up images of scanners. Um, but now, uh, in the 21st century, a very good chunk of our business information is already digital. It's born digital uh, using productivity tools you all are used to using all the time, uh, maybe electronic forms, social media, email. Uh, that's obviously a huge carrier uh, of the kind of ca uh, content that needs to be captured. But when we asked you, for what content types are you capturing and declaring, AIM 
research finds that while 43% of you still say that it's scan documents is the most dominant type captured, uh, incoming, those incoming electronic documents like PDFs and web forms are cited by almost 40% of you. And we expect this to grow. But please. Uh, don't uh, print these things and then rescan them. Uh, not when they were born digital to begin with. That's uh, that's lunacy, and you know who you are. Uh, but don't do it. Don't do it. As I said, we've uh, talked a lot about that movement from uh, just feeling of a scan to archive just for storage purposes or to eliminate paper or be able to destroy paper uh, to scan to process using recognition tools that take information objects from that scanned image and allow you to reuse it and repurpose it and drive it through a variety of different processes. And now we're finding that regardless of your vertical, uh, your business focus, um, capture really is, is should be an integral part and uh, accomplish on the leading edge of that process. And by that, we mean that first touch point with content. And it applies not only to the capture and conversion of physical content, but also those, those digitally born uh, content assets that we just talked about in office applications, web applications, and social media. So forward thinking information professionals are really addressing this uh, multidimensional approach. And uh, we want to show you how to do that. So Justin, this is a good question for you. Can you give some examples, maybe by specific industries, uh, vertical, and then some more horizontal, uh, horizontal verticals or horizontal processes where uh, content is being captured uh, outside of a traditional uh, brick and mortar environment and what we would call at the edge of a process. What are some of your customers doing? Where are they finding some success? Yeah, sure, Peggy. So, you know, if we're specifically talking about opportunities around uh, cloud and, and capturing content at the, the edges of the organization, uh, as you might imagine, we're, we're continuing to see significant interest in capturing uh, at the edge and uh, paper-heavy verticals like financial services and insurance. Um, we've also seen demand in newer verticals like fintech or financial tech, where these companies are really trying to out-innovate uh, traditional financial service vendors. So we see them more willing to rely on, on cloud technology to solve these capture problems faster than they might be otherwise too with traditional on-premise solutions. And you know, we're seeing some of these um, typical justifications for these, for these solutions where the desire is to shorten cycle times for those critical processes, getting access to that content uh, more quickly, and, uh, and just overall improving that, that customer experience, that customer service aspect. Um, we've seen a lot of use cases around loan origination, claim origination, uh, customer onboarding, some more horizontal use cases like uh, like invoice processing, and and more recently a, a lot around identity verification. So these are just a few of the the use cases we see and and the verticals we're seeing them in. Justin, following up on that, do you think that this pressure to out innovate, and I really like that, um, do you think that pressure to out innovate um, really takes the customer uh, the customer uh, usability first. A lot of what you cited um, seems to me has just a lot of transactional nature to it. Yeah, right. So I think I think the movement to the cloud, the movement to uh, hosted services, really allows these 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 companies that are willing to to take a look at this next generation technology allows them to move move and, and solve these problems a lot quicker than if you are bound by on-premise, uh, you know, very heavy, heavy-handed platforms. Um, it also allows these companies to, to try out through proof of concepts, test out these, these solutions. So, you know, take, take for example, if you want to you try a proof of concept with a traditional system, you know, that can take some time to acquire the hardware, to get the system all spun up, to install any databases or application servers where with the cloud system, you can you can really, at a very low risk, you know, spin up an environment in a few minutes, 
and and have a system that you can test out in a matter of days as opposed to weeks or months. So yeah, I think this is a good opportunity to uh, to innovate within the within your enterprise. It might actually make organizations more amenable to uh, letting their customers um, even create some use cases and, and even sit on some task force or workforces to, to do this. I think um, knowing that it doesn't have to be an all or nothing uh, or a full commitment um, probably uh, brings them closer to uh, the customer in terms of uh, letting the customer dictate some things and nice to have. That's right. Good. Thanks. Thank you. As we said by the research, for many organizations, the role of capture um, is being extended. It's, it's a combination. It's sort of a hybrid world. It's paper and it's other inbound digital content. That is a reality. It can create some amazing opportunities, but it probably um, it probably creates some challenges too. Um, certainly from an opportunity perspective, uh, directing the content to either a line of business processes or to people, I think customer service representatives, for example, uh, for action, um, there, that, that's, a real, that's a real benefit uh, for sure. Um, Justin, what what do we mean by that? Um, can you give some examples about how a process would be drawn on a combination of captured content uh, in particular uh, applications or activities? So it'd be a ca it's a combination of some scan documents, perhaps, and then those uh, born digital ones. Where would that come into play? Yeah. So so we've we've been looking at an evolution of of your traditional capture process models where, where you know, in previous years you, these were linear, linear, opaque processes that were more internally focused. You've had slower service level agreements. Um, for example, you might send some communication to your customer, say a, a credit card application, and that activity might generate some incoming content which you then would, would capture and process internally uh, more like in a batch mode. And, and which will ultimately generate another notification to your customer. So we're, we're evolving from this linear throw it over the fence process model to what we've been referring to as the the digital world process model or, or capture 2.0. And so this this capture 2.0 world is more dynamic and transparent and, and it's more externally focused and more conversational with the customer. On top of that, the SLAs are are much faster and, and sometimes even immediate. So. So this Capture 2.0 world lends itself to this omni-channel capture concept where you might generate content in the traditional mailroom, but you're also going to generate content at the edges of, of the organization via mobile or web interfaces, um, and also with, with this constant personalized communication and, and, and response cycles, uh, and with all different types of content, like you said. So you're, we're not just dealing with images anymore, but also native e-documents, electronic forms, and and more so now video and, and audio content. So, so yeah, so one transaction might generate uh, various types of content coming in from different channels that ultimately needs to be uh, synced back up uh, as, it, as it moves through, through the process. Having, uh, having just gone through the uh, uh, real estate mortgage uh, experience myself, I think about uh, online, uh, even digital signature technology, but they still need to know that it's me, and so I had to send via email a picture of my ID, um, my driver's license. That would be a good example, wouldn't it, where you've got the born digital, you've got the forms, but you, you still have to show them that you are who you say you are. That's that, that's that's very true, and I'd say that's one of the use cases that we've seen uh, the largest demand for recently. So, I, ID verification for multiple use cases, whether it's you know just verifying who you are uh, for um, a loan or verifying that that who you are for a customer onboarding scenario. This this concept of distributed identity verification seems to be increasing. 
Yeah, the, the the lowly driver's license and and how much we still depend on it. Uh, uh, amazing, amazing. So thank you, Justin. So while combining these different inputs and these different channels, I like the omni-channel uh, phrase you used. Um, by doing that seamlessly and then routing them to the same process would provide obvious benefits in uniformity and flexibility. But AIM Research found that almost 50% of folks said they have a mostly ad hoc arrangement when it comes to various inputs. Um, and 22% of them just process them separately. So if it's largely inconsistent, unpredictable and disconnected to a workflow or a seamless process, um, that's obviously not realizing the full potential. Uh, why do you think that is, Justin? Why, why is that so hard? Um, is it that they just don't understand the possibilities? Is it that uh, folks don't know how to connect the different pieces? Or they just think maybe that these uh, uh, are one-offs? Well, if I had to guess, it would be that, you know, it's the path of least resistance. You know, the bottom line is I think it's a lot easier to add on a new application in a silo than taking a, you know, a higher level holistic view of, of your overall process model and trying to figure out how to weave in these different, these different channels and, and syncing them all up. Even if it will provide considerable improvement, in, uh, in uniformity and flexibility in the long run. So I think it's a matter of, you know, do you want to take the, the, the due diligence and the planning up front in order to factor in all these new channels, or is it just easier to, you know, say let's, let's, let's add on a new mobile capture capability and let's not, you know, figure out how to, how to weave that content into our overall process model. So bottom line, I think it's, like I said, the path of least resistance is, is, is probably the likely cause. Yeah, don't mess up things that I, I know how they work and uh, don't make me work too hard. Um, clearly, uh, change management, as always, uh, with everything, uh, plays a huge role here. But I think you're right. I just There are a lot of people that just don't think uh, in a process way. And that's not easy. Uh, not everyone has those uh, capabilities, but it is important uh, to do that rather than just bolting on. Um, I think you're absolutely right there. So automation, is that, is that the key uh, to just seamlessly uh, identify and classify information? And importantly, not just in its captured state, but also in context. What is the intent? What is the meaning? Uh, to bring it immediately under corporate control faster and more securely. Um, and that helps you meet any regulatory or legal or industry requirements. You hope that it is seamless. You hope that it takes the human element and the manual element out of it, which of course are two huge factors in getting it to scale, um, always. Uh, depending on how complicated uh, processes are, um, that's, that's huge, or you, you just, you'll just lose control. 45% of the organizations we surveyed do some type of auto classification. 28% of it is part of a workflow and 18% of it is at the point of ingestion. So it's clearly uh, a long way to go. And of course, use of integration with your target systems like your ERP systems or your CRM systems or even your content management systems can not only source but then apply key metadata to validate all that. And it allows the user to make corrections to that metadata before uploading to a process or an application. That's pretty big. So Justin, what are some of the benefits of uh, capture automation as it relates to, say, exceptions on the fly and corrections of, of metadata? Yeah, so of course, 100% automation of classified content and extracted metadata from documents is, is the holy grail, but um, efficient exception handling is, is a necessary evil because, you know, partly because of the technology we're dealing with, you know, um, optical character recognition is, is not a perfect technology. And, and especially when you're dealing with distributed scenarios, 
um, you're not always going to be dealing with high quality images, or, or maybe your business rules might trigger um, different types of exceptions. Um, so, so when done right, automating the exception handling should, should guide users so that they only have to deal with the exceptions and not all the other content that, that was captured. Um, and so if you can handle those exceptions early in the process, it can be sometimes easier to fix uh, and can ultimately lead to cost savings and, and improved um, data accuracy. So, for example, you might, um, you might have a scenario where the customer is right in front of you with the physical paper documents, and then once they walk out the door, it's going to be a lot harder for you to have another opportunity to maybe rescan or retake a picture of those, of those images. So, you know, there's some real, real reasons why you might want to deal with those exceptions where that content is being captured. Um, and if you're, if you're capture enabling your customers or, or maybe your field facing employees, more often than not, these people, they're going to be more familiar with the content that's being captured and are likely going to be in a better position to, to one, you know, help identify the exceptions, but two, to quickly and accurately fix those exceptions. So I think there's real reasons why pushing the exception handling out to the edge at the point of capture makes real sense. Well, you're right. I mean, there's still a human element down the line, potentially, and it's amazing what a few uh, missing steps in a process can do uh, to throw things off. So imagine that that individual would have to interpret the data down the line and then uh, make those perceived corrections. So uh, the time cost, uh, the post-process metadata cleansing, uh, the time savings there, uh, that would also obviously streamline everything. Yeah, good, good, good point there. If you're standing right there with the customer, uh, you probably know better uh, what's going on. So let's look at um, our mobile workforce as uh, just a huge driver uh, in what we're doing here. And uh, I don't know about your organization. We've certainly seen it. Uh, at AIM, that it is the line of business and the process owners that are driving innovation uh, today and also driving investment in any kind of technology. These line of business managers have a growing need to extend their interaction with their on-prem processes and content uh, to their colleagues in the field and their business partners. It's not just uh, folks that are within your organization, but any members of your supply chain uh, at any uh, time, whether they are regular partners or, or, or not. And so capturing content early on and speeding up the commenting and the sign-off um, uh, cycles that might be required is, is absolutely huge. So think of, as Justin said, the, these mobile devices that are fully equipped with cameras. Uh, capable of a single shot photography or video with audio and, you know, even capturing paper when we have to um, and, and capturing signatures. Uh, to be able to do that from anywhere at any time and upload it uh, to those um, applications that are either in-house uh, or in the cloud is, is, is pretty, pretty huge. We asked you, if you could do that, what would you say is probably the most important aspect of it? And, and interestingly, uh, at its basic level, it's simply sharing the documents that folks need in order to do their job. And 75% of you cited that. You could see that. If we could have um, the same experience out of the office as we do in the office or uh, have the ability to uh, interact with the same content as our uh, colleague who may be back at the uh, mothership, um, that would be really, really important to us. And it's amazing how few organizations even uh, offer that. We talked early on, uh, remember, uh, about cloud. We said that some other AIM research we've done said that 32% of you are, are trying to understand or define your strategy for cloud deployment of capture. Um, so here's some additional details there. And this is where that third piece that we talked about, that third leg in the stool, the output and the deployment comes in. Um, it's impossible to discuss mobile content and not discuss cloud. It's become a major discussion point related to that access and user engagement in a device agnostic way. According to 54% of you, um, 
you're using some sort of hybrid model of both cloud and on-prem, and that's your preferred method, while 25% of you are leaning more heavily towards a cloud-only approach. Does that concept scare you? Uh, it doesn't really have to. Uh, we'll, we'll learn in just a minute that, that it doesn't, and that is the beauty of that, because uh, it's not all the good, good things. It's not just all the good things that you're doing to, to pull that content in and put it through processes. It's, it's what you're doing with it and, and who's going to be able to access it. Like anything, uh, there are some challenges uh, there. Um, and 29% of you are looking at rolling out some kind of mobile access, but only 40% are providing mobile access of any kind. And only 11% of you would describe that as universal across all your staff. And a tiny little bit, only 5% are providing mobile access to your project partners. So Justin, what do you see as some of the challenges of uh, using mobile capture? Uh, what are some of the wrong perceptions you see among some of your customers or or potential customers. You, you mentioned quality of image, and we know from other AIM research the perceived need for a wet signature uh, on documents. What, what do you see as some of the, uh, the biggest challenges or, or, or untruths out there? Yeah, one of, uh, one of the biggest challenges I've seen is, is uh, an under, underestimating the nuances of mobile capture. Um, and thinking that your traditional mobile uh, development teams have the expertise to understand these challenges um, with creating an easy-to-use capture application that, that is capable of generating images that have good enough quality so that they can be used for automating the recognition of that content. Um, and, and so capturing with, with mobile devices presents a whole set of image quality challenges that are not uh, typically a consideration with traditional, when a traditional scanner might be used. Um, so mobile capture can introduce blur, glare, poor lighting, quadrilateral cropping, um, inconsistent image resolution, and a whole slew of, of quality challenges that require non-traditional solutions. And, and most mobile projects that I've, that I've seen are typically unaware of these, of these pitfalls. So I think partnering uh, the mobile dev team with a capture uh, subject matter expert can help, can help mitigate these, uh, these challenges. I'd say that's, that's, that's the biggest challenge I see with mobile, mobile captures, thinking that you're going to use your same existing uh, processes and going to get the same recognition results. And it's, it's just not the case. Have organizations learned to overcome that besides just improving the technology? Um, what, what else could they do? Um, you mentioned partnering, certainly, to get those added capabilities. Is there anything else uh, uh, people can do as a stopgap? Well, I think, I think it is important. You know, you don't know what you don't know. And so what I've seen is that if these mobile projects get kicked off, they know they want to capture some documents, they think it's as easy as just, you know, taking a picture, and then they're going to be able to uh, push that, those images through their traditional capture systems. Well, you know, you, you need to understand what are some of these challenges up front so that you can, you can plan them in your, your application development. So I think that's, that's the, the ideal way is that you, you, know, you make yourself aware of these challenges and so you can plan for it. And you're, you're typically not going to have that resource on your mobile team. You know, the teams that are building these iOS and Android apps are, are not the same teams that are typically involved in, in you know, defining how your content is captured and defining your, your business processes. Yeah, good, good point. So how do you take that one step further and not only assuage some of those uh, concerns and, 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 and get, that, get that quality improved, but how do you make it where everyone is going to actually want to use it? They're going to want to use it and, and either seek it out uh, or push the organization to drive it through even more processes or involve other uh, 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 departments, other touch points. Yeah, well, I think it's important to start small and, and try to get some quick wins. Uh, so don't don't try to boil the ocean. So maybe think about targeting a, a single 
high frequency document type and use case with some with some basic functionality. Uh, maybe that doesn't include um, auto recognition at, at first. Maybe it's you know the user is manually classifying the doc type. So you know you can start small and get some quick wins. Um, and also, I think this is, this should be obvious, but I'll I'll say it anyway. Um, today's users are exposed to a, a whole slew of mobile applications, both business related and and not. Um, and so they've developed this expectation of what a good mobile application look like, looks like, and feels like. Um, and so you should really, you know, they have an expectation of ease of use. So you should have a maniacal focus on on building highly intuitive apps that that delight your customer. And that doesn't always come down to you know actual functionality. You know, some of some of my favorite applications to use, you know, they just provide a little bit of what you might think of as magic in the app that you know you, it gives you a, a tingle when you when it does a certain thing. So I think just making the user um, really enjoy using the app is 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 gonna going to cause them to use it more frequently. So, um, and and lastly, I'll just restate: I think it's imperative that you partner with a subject matter expert that can help guide the application and system design, and not not solely rely on that mobile development team. Yeah, I mean, we've all become rock stars at home because of our um, uh, uh, easy-to-use devices. Uh, we said a long time ago, no one gives you uh, an owner's manual uh, for most of these things. You you expect it to work, and it does. And as you say, somewhere between uh, A and B, uh, some magic happens, and and we're just uh, we're taking that for granted. And of course, there. Uh, not everyone can think that way. Not everyone can um, think about a, a user experience and just, God, just cutting out one more step of, of, of drudgery. That's what we've seen uh, really makes people just say, great, I did this in half the time. It was fun, and I get it. I know how to use it. That's that's good. Good good, good points there. Maniacal. You're, you're giving me some good good phrases there, Justin. I, I love it. A maniacal approach to that. I, I think that's fantastic. So it is a it is a holistic, even though, as Justin said, you want to start out small. Uh, you want it to be something that's important. Uh, otherwise, why do it? And you want to you want it to be something that you know uh, could um, help. Uh, reduce some costs or achieve better uh, efficiency, things, uh, think of uh, uh, better response time. We said the customer uh, service uh, aspect of this is just so, 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 so critical. Um, but it must be uh, looking at both the internal and the uh, external perspectives. So if we're saying that dynamic cap uh, capture using mobile devices or other devices uh, to capture content at that first ton touch point and bring it to the business process at the leading edge, um, yeah, those are there are significant benefits. It's streamlining the operational processes, allows you to get control over the content faster. Uh, remember, we said you could apply some rules uh, uh, that may be uh, regulation-based or, or legally based, and you can initiate those appropriate actions early on. Uh, that's got to minimize the risk a, as a result. And of course, accuracy is key, uh, and the ability to make those corrections or even things like address corrections before the content is uploaded. Um, that means placing that capability of validation into the hands of that mobile uh, user. Um, and in order to be successful, um, like any project of this nature, you need to understand the overall goal. And how do you know you're successful? Um, when designing this, um, you need to uh, look at the interface. You need to look at appropriate metadata. Uh, what would you use? What would be useful uh, to repurpose and to drive through different processes? Uh, what are those reference sources? And what's the establishment of some sort of validation processes? And we'd like to suggest that uh, some first steps you can take in that whole process is to Think about it. Think about some areas in your organization where uh, dynamic capture would benefit in both labor and physical costs. And don't forget, that includes paper and content that's digitally born. Ask yourself whether um, there's any regulatory or legal reason why you can't do that or um, what are the requirements that need to be applied and align your mobile capture accordingly. Um, 
standardize and automate your processes whenever and wherever possible. That's sort of the, the default. That's sort of a duh statement. But we'd suggest that you do it before you try to systemize it. And by all means, um, make sure that you'll be able to tell if you're successful or not. Um, Justin, this would probably be a good time to ask you, what are some, I mentioned a few, but what are some good metrics um, that people apply to this kind of thing? Um, are there some standard metrics um, in uh, either cost savings or improved efficiencies? Um, what are some specific things that you've seen your customers actually cite, wow, at the end of this six months, we were able to do this and we were able to do that. What are some typical um, metrics, just in terms of business activities, not actual numbers? Yeah, I, I think probably the the one I see the most across the wide range a wide range of processes is is trimming the cycle time down for a, a given transaction. So, you know, I want this transaction to go from you know X number of days to X number of hours or minutes. And so I think, you know, especially in the distributed use cases, that, that seems to be one of the most important factors, not only trimming the cycle time down, but, but getting access to that content um, quicker than they were able to otherwise. So that's probably the, the number one goal and metric I've seen. Of course, it's going to come down to your specific use case and the problem you're trying to solve for, but that's, that's pretty pervasive. Yeah. Um, definitely, and nobody likes to talk about uh, reducing labor uh, force, uh, uh, cutting employees. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's a, that's a, a, a natural uh, uh, outcome there. But uh, yeah, good, 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 good point there. So we talked yeah, about I, I, again I, I would, at the beginning. I, yeah. I was just going to say, I would say that in my experience, that's not typically a a driver. It's more, like you said, a, a, a byproduct of, of shifting yeah. the process. Yeah, yeah. Nobody starts a project by saying, if we do this, we can reduce our work staff by a, a quarter. No. You hope that you free them up from drudgery to be more innovative and, and customer-focused. Uh, You're right. Absolutely. So, you know, another huge obstacle stopping people is just, oh, yeah, that's great. That's great for the big guys. Um, but what about me and my organization? Um, uh, how can I take advantage of this? Or is it, uh, is it only for the rich and famous? What, 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 what would you like people to think about that in, in terms of having to build it themselves or um, uh, uh, looking at this as a, as a major commitment, Justin? Yeah, well, you know, we, Dell EMC and the, the Enterprise Content Division, we've been thinking about this problem from, from various different uh, aspects. And, and we have a new product that we've been, uh, we released earlier this year, and it really tries to target, you know, this specific scenario of, of capturing content at the edges of the organization. Uh, and so the product I'm referring to is, is called Snap. Snap is a distributed capture application that um, it's an out-of-the-box application that uh, it's part of our our Leap cloud uh, content platform. Uh, and so Leap is a uh, content platform that includes a number of content-related applications uh, as well as uh, content uh, cloud services. And so SNAP is, is specifically targeted at, um, at, the, uh, it, at distributed capture use cases. It's, it's a true uh, cloud-hosted multi-tenant application um, and really targeting the distributed capture uh, user persona. So unlike uh, somebody who might be their job responsibility is, is about capturing lo large con uh, a large volume of content, SNAP is really about focusing on the distributed capture knowledge worker who you know doesn't have a need to capture as much content so it's it's more uh, focused on on providing a guided experience through that capture process so unlike a, a mailroom application where you might have multiple steps and multiple users uh, participating in that capture that capture flow snap is really about a single user doing all of the capture activities in a, in a single city so anywhere from scan and importing, to dealing with any classification exceptions, dealing with any metadata exceptions, and ultimately exporting the content to, to the system of record, whether that's some other um, 
cloud-hosted content repository or your on-premise uh, content repository. Um, so we've, as I said earlier, you know, having a maniacal focus on user experience. That's that's really what we've what we focused on for for Snap, uh, the web application as well as our, our upcoming mobile application. Um, and we we do have uh, some out, an out of the box user experience. So you know, you can you can start using Snap right away. You can spin up a Snap environment in a matter of, of a few minutes. Um, so unlike, you, know, you don't have to acquire your own hardware. You don't have to install your own applications. This is something that's, because it's in the cloud, you can spin it right up. You get access to a dev uh, test and production environment right away. And you can export content to a multitude of, of back-end systems. So although, you know, obviously we have our own uh, repositories here at Dell EMC, our capture platforms are, are totally open. And so we have uh, compatibility with any CMIS uh, compatible backend. So I guess what I would like to offer is, is you know, if, if there is interested in in taking a look at a a low risk cloud application to see what the possibilities are, you can go to our uh, our website, uh, leap.emc.com, uh, scroll down and select the the Snap um, product, and then complete the register now form, and and we can spin up a a test environment for you, and you can take a look at, at what is possible in the world of, of cloud capture. In a matter of minutes, uh, that's uh, that's impressive. What um, uh, even even the least uh, technically oriented person uh, can do it. What sort of uh, folks internally are ideal to test this out? Yeah, so typically this is going to be a a business analyst type that you know that's trying to solve a, a particular uh, a business problem, a, a transactional problem. So um, you know there is no um, there is no coding involved here. There is no um, you don't need to understand any development languages or anything like that. But you do need, you do need to understand you know what is the problem I'm trying to solve. What do my what types of documents am I going to be dealing with, and and what do I want to get off of those documents. Um, so one of the cool things about Snap is, you know, it's, it's really cool to have this automated document classification and data extraction. Um, but a lot of systems require this upfront configuration of the of the rules to to be able to recognize those documents. And and of course you can do that within Snap. We provide a design environment that allows you to do that. But we also have this this new innovation that we call the um, the template request service, and this is a way for you to say, "Hey, I've got this document type. I don't want to learn how to how to design the templates needed to recognize this. I just want to upload a sample, a few sample images. Here's the name of the document. Here are the five or ten fields I want to extract from it. I submit it to our template request service, and then I get a a, a template published to my environment within 24 hours, and I can begin automating uh, the capture of that document. So that's one way to to reduce that upfront uh, configuration. Thank you. Thanks. I would like to invite our listeners to, uh, if you haven't already, please download um, a um, an ebook uh, that we have have recently published and uh, based on additional research, it's uh, our paper free. Um, uh, document. Uh, we talked a lot about the role of dynamic capture and mobile capture um, and cloud um, uh, deployment in that paper. Uh, and I think you'll find some very useful benchmarking um, stats that you can share and you can use as an internal marketing tool. So uh, no cost to do it. Um, please do that. And Dell EMC, uh, we're very uh, proud to have had them uh, as one of the underwriters for that. So, Teresa, are we at question time yet? We're at question time. Thank you. And um, just to let everyone know, not only the link to the, the, this research paper, but also the link to the, the SNAP trial that Justin was talking about, they're both available for you to click on right now in the resources list section to the right of the, your slide area. Um, just click on those. It's going to open in a new browser tab for you. So just you know, click them now. When the webinar is over with, you can go back and, and check out uh, all of the information that's in there uh, for you. Um, and just you know, we have been listening to Peggy Winton of AIM and, and Justin Betancourt of Dell EMC. And um, as we get into the questions, one of the things I'm 
um, inviting you not only to come in and post questions, but come up to uh, your desktop right now and just want to just get your immediate feedback of just what's the most val valuable thing that you've learned so far today. Um, Higgy and Justin have been sharing a lot of really really good, useful information. just want to get some immediate feedback from you right now um, just as we go into the questions. So I appreciate if you would do that. Um, and as we're talking about the, with those questions, um, Justin, I, someone here is asking that if um, that link that you have there uh, for the SNAP trial, can people just go there just to see a video demo of this, or is that just straight to download? Uh, they're just looking to get a little bit more information at this stage. How can people do that? Yeah, no, there there is a, a video on that, that page. Um, if if there's not enough um, detail there for you, I'm happy to you know take take some questions offline. Um, but yeah, there, there there should be enough content there to give you a, a basic idea of the look and feel and, and what's possible with SNAP. Okay, thank you. Um, and then another question that's come in, and, uh, and here's the crazy part, a few of the questions that have already come in, you guys have already addressed them. But there's one that I don't think we've fully got to address yet. Um, in with the variety of different things that we've been talking about with the dynamic capture and uh, what are ways that we can get to approach our executives, to our bosses, our team leaders, just to get them on board with embracing more of the, the dynamic capture processes and all the different things we've been discussing today. And um, Justin, if we can start with you, and Peggy, feel free to chime in on that. Yeah, so I think, as I said earlier, the, the whole um, opportunity with these cloud technologies that are that have become available, it, it's a lower cost, lower risk way to, to try out these technologies. And so whether you can prove these out through a, a POC or I think even better yet, targeting some, some low-hanging fruit, some, some quick wins, I think is, is always going to be the way to uh, you know, show these executives that there is true value here. Here's an example. It's low risk. It's low cost. And you can build upon those wins over time. And that would be that would be one of my recommendations. I was just talking to having to be a, a, a someone in the uh, records management department at a major healthcare provider, who now says that in addition to just continuing to justify the need for uh, applying some of the uh, special handling um, uh, for obvious governance and compliance reasons, these line of business, um, uh, cost centers, I should say, or cost of business, um, are feeling so much more pressure to justify their existence. I would take what uh, Justin has said, think about things that can specifically change an executive opinion from you as a cost of doing business to an enabler of the business, and by being able to test some uh, very specific and, and small and targeted ways to show very specific improvements in efficiency or taking uh, one uh, regular, even mundane uh, process and significantly uh, reduce uh, response time or processing time, and do that in a proactive way. Um, I think that will definitely um, make the point, rather than uh, so much of what executives do, which is to say, oh, you're going to love this. I promise. Trust me, it'll work. Um, make that proof of concept first. Some great tips and ideas. Thank you. Um, just want to let everyone in the audience know, um, if you haven't already, AIM 17 is coming up. And we're going to be in Orlando this year in March. And uh, website there, aimconference.com. We do have early bird pricing going on right now through the end of January. Um, we're saving a $300 discount on that. And, um, and Peggy, I know that you work so closely with our uh, events VP and the events team for what's going on with this. I think we have one of our keynotes already confirmed and uh, some great, great pre-con sessions already lined up. Uh, anything, uh, some things that you can share with our audience already about uh, AIM-17? 
Well, it's a perfect segue um, from what we've been chatting about with Justin about the strive for efficiency and the strive for um, out-innovating our competition, uh, leading with a customer-centric focus. Um, it's really uh, with our community in mind that we have designed this entire experience, and, and it is that. Any of you that have been around AIM for a while know that we used to be in the big conference and exhibition business. Um, we're not anymore. That's not what we like and that's not what we think you like uh, or is sustainable. And so when we got back into a pure uh, conference uh, environment, we did so by saying there's no such thing as a free uh, big trade show uh, floor where uh, people are just getting uh, lost in the shuffle. This is um, for like-minded information professionals at any level. And you will find a home there, and you will find folks who um, have been through uh, what you're struggling with uh, and or are happy to uh, share uh, successes that they've had. And I, I know uh, it's a warm environment, and it's one that uh, we strive to ensure that it's uh, prescriptive as well and that you will go back to your offices with solutions. So come on. Love to see you. Let us help you get there. Certainly. And also there's a link to the conference page um, in that resources list next to your slide area. Uh, pretty handy of me to stick all of those links there for you. Um, we are getting at the end of our webinar hour. and just want to remind you that this webinar is being recorded, and it will be available in the next day or two at the AIM.org's resources webinars page. Um, don't forget to download those resources. Um, and also, when the webinar is over, that survey is going to open on your desktop, or you can click the survey link in uh, those widgets across the bottom right now. Um, and you, we do value your feedback, and, and I would greatly appreciate hearing from you. Um, so appreciate if you would take a few moments to, to offer your comments and suggestions in there. Very much want to thank our underwriter, Dell EMC. Without the support from our solution providers, AIM wouldn't be able to provide you with these free educational programs like our webinars. So thank you, Dell EMC, for your support. And as we bring the webinar to a close, I do want to leave you with our speaker's closing thoughts or key takeaway. And um, first, let me start with Justin Bettencourt of Dell EMC, your closing thoughts today. Well, um, hopefully we shed some light on, on how you can get more from your capture systems by, um, by evaluating opportunities around distributed and mobile capture scenarios and, and how you know, capture is evolving from this, this back office system to more of a dynamic multi-channel uh, system and, uh, and, and how there's opportunities to take advantage of, of a lot of the new uh, technology that's coming out around you know, real-time cloud capture services, SaaS applications, and, and so on. And so, um, so I, I hope it was uh, valuable, and thank you for your time today. Thank you, Justin. And Justin, I want to, yeah, I want to join Teresa in saying thanks. This was a lot of fun, and I appreciate your uh, very specific customer uh, examples. I think that helps to bring it home. Uh, and I would just say that uh, Take AIM is a, a classic example where uh, it was uh, the business users in a particular department um, that uh, pushed um, some inexpensive uh, but highly successful um, investment in a tool um, and did it before um, any executives would have asked for it or uh, IT even got involved. Um, and you have the power. Uh, you know what can be improved. And now with some of the solutions uh, that Justin shared with us, the fact that you can get ramped up with very little risk and very little time, uh, you have nothing to lose and everything to gain by changing your role uh, from just a, a role uh, a rule uh, enforcer to uh, a process enabler. Thank you. I was Peggy Winton from AIM. And thank you, everyone, for your time today. For AIM, this is Teresa Resick, and we will see you at our next webinar. Have a good afternoon.